open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. America is a nation that has rich agriculture roots. Farming, especially in this particular area, is very rich. Many, many people today are doing that farming around our area. And as you take notice to our, our theme for Bible school, it looks like we're in a cornfield and looks like we're getting ready maybe to do a little bit of farming. We are going to do some sowing. We're going to be sowing some seed throughout the week. And we're going to plant that, uh, that seed hopefully in some fertile soil. And hopefully that seed, which would be the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, will bring forth some fruit. But Amen. we're calling our theme for Bible school the barnyard. The barnyard. You know, throughout the Bible, you're going to find many illustrations, uh, many sayings that have to do with farming throughout the Bible. Jesus gave the parable of the sower who went forth to sow seed. Someone that does planting. That'd be a farmer. Right. Uh, you remember, Jesus said that he was the vine and we are the branches. And in that parable, Jesus compares God to a husbandman. What is a husbandman? A farmer. In the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says that God planted. You say, what did God plant? The Bible says God planted a garden. Amen. That garden, of course, we know as the Garden of Eden. So I want to talk to you this morning about old farmer's advice. Old farmer's advice. Now, just in case you think, well, preacher, I, I don't think I need any advice from any old farmer. I want you to understand country folks aren't as dumb as you think they are. They're a whole lot smarter than we give them credit for. Today, I believe we're lacking in a couple of different areas. We're lacking in the area of common sense, and then we're lacking in the area of horse sense. Now, I want you to take notice to what the Bible has to say about some good, old-fashioned farmer's advice. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20, the Bible says, Hear counsel. If you're going to get some wisdom... You're first of all going to have to open up your ears. If you're not willing to open up your ears, you're not going to hear what God has. That's right. He says, hear counsel and receive instruction. That may make it a part of you. Take it in. Don't let it bounce off of you. Soak it in. Absorb it. Hear counsel. Receive instruction that thou mayest be wise. Here it is. Wise in thy latter end. God said in the end of it all, I want you to be wise. If you're going to be wise, you're going to hear counsel. You're going to receive instruction. I want to be smarter today than I was yesterday. How about you? Amen. I want to know a little bit more today than I did yesterday. Amen. I think we ought to be improving. Some people live and learn and other folks just live. My friend, we ought to be getting smarter as we're getting older. As we age, we ought to be getting some wisdom. And we ought to get some book knowledge, and we ought to get some book wisdom. And the book knowledge and the book wisdom that we need to get is from this old black book right here, the Bible, the Word of God. So let me give you some old advice from an old, old, old book. It might be old, but it's not broke. And that book is the Bible. And if we're going to be wise, we're going to receive we're going to hear people today, politicians today, and some people in the media today want to make us out like we're a bunch of redneck, uneducated hillbillies. But I just want you to understand something. We stand for the flag. Amen. We kneel for the cross. Amen. And we believe this whole book, the Bible, the Word Amen. of God. They say, oh, that bunch of rednecks, all they do is cling to their religion and their guns. Amen. Well, we might cling to our religion and our guns. I'll tell you this, we're going to stand where we're supposed to stand. Amen. We're going to obey God and do what God tells us to do. Real. Now, I want to give you some old advice from this farmer. Old farmer's advice, just plain old common sense. Let me give you some biblical advice from a farmer's vernacular. Number one. 
Life is much simpler when we plow around the stump. Preacher, what does that mean? That means you better choose your battles carefully. If you're on a tractor and you've got a plow on the back and you figure you're going to do a battle with that stump, I'm going to tell you right now, that stump is going to win the battle. It'll be a whole lot easier and a whole lot less grief if you plow around the stump instead of trying to plow over the stump. What's that mean, preacher? That means this. You better not beat yourself to death with what you can't do, but instead do what you can do. Amen. The Bible tells us this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. For we brought nothing into this world. Boy, isn't that the truth? Amen. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Notice the Bible says here, we ought to be content. The, the Bible is telling us there is only so much we can do. Only so much. You can't do everything, but you can do something. Now you got some folks that don't want to do anything. Well, I can't do anything. No, you can do something. And then you got people on the other side that they think, well, I want to do it all. And they don't have time to do it all. And the people that want to do it all end up doing everything about halfway. You can't do everything, but you can do something. Amen. There's two truths that you need to know. Truth number one, there is a God. Amen. Truth number two, you are not Him. Right. <laughs> and since you are not God, you can't do everything. It is a whole lot easier to plow around the stump than to plow over the stump. You, you want to keep life a little bit more simpler, a little bit more easy? Plow around instead of plowing over. You know what we got today? We got stump jumpers. Stump jumpers. We have stump jumpers when it comes to making others do right. Stump jumpers. Do you realize you can't make other people do right? You are only in control of yourself. Now as a pastor, I can get pretty frustrated. I can get pretty aggravated when people don't do what I say to do. Can you imagine a God in heaven who looks down from heaven and says, they're not doing what I told them to do. Have you ever given someone advice and they did the complete opposite? Do you realize you cannot make them do what you want them to do? There's only so much you can do. But we become stump jumpers in that area. You might just have to plow around. Because if you don't plow around the stump, all you're going to do is tear your tractor up and rip your plow to pieces. President Harry Truman, he had a plaque on his desk that said, The buck stops here. Now, the reason why he had that on his desk was because it meant that he was not going to shirk responsibility. You know, many people today want to do what we call passing the buck. And he said, no, the buck stops here. In other words, as the president of the United States, I am responsible and I'm going to make decisions. Now, my friend, we're responsible. And we are accountable. And the buck ought to stop with you. You can't control everybody else, but you can control you. Too often times we want to blame everybody else too. Our lives ought to bring glory to God. The Bible says, and whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Don't be a stump jumper when it comes to making others do right. Don't be a stump jumper when it comes to pressing your will against God's will. Can I tell you who's going to win in the end? You're going to press your will against God's will. God's going to win. Right. Now you might have a big tractor. And you might have a good plow. But if you go up against that stump, I'm going to tell you who's going to win. That stump will win. And there's some people that are beating themselves to death. I wish I could make them do right. You can't do it. Stop being a stump jumper. I wish I could get my will over God's will. Stop being a stump jumper. Ephesians 5.17 says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, 
but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Amen. You ought to understand God's will and do what God wants you to do and don't fight against God's will. Amen. Jesus was talking to some soldiers and the soldiers, Jesus gave them a bit of advice. It says, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, talking about Jesus, saying, what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. You know what Jesus told them to do? Be content. That does not mean we stop trying. I'm going to be content, and so I'm going to go home, kick up my feet on the couch, the lazy boy, the recliner, get myself a bag of potato chips, and a can of soda and park right in front of the television set and be content. That's not being content. That's being lazy. You ought to strive. You ought to work to get ahead and do the best you can. But you also be content with what you got. And if you're not content with what you got, you're going to end up be poor. Because discontentment makes rich men poor. Contentment will make poor men rich. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Patrick Henry, one of our great forefathers said, give me liberty or give me death. Today's generation just says, give me, give me, give me. We want, we want, we want. Better, you, I hope you don't get what you deserve. No. Jesus said, be content. Discontentment hurt Achan. Remember Achan in the Bible? Achan in the Bible saw some things. The Bible said, when the walls of Jericho came down, God said, don't take anything in there because it's cursed. Leave it alone. But Achan saw some things. He saw a wedge of gold. He saw some silver. He saw a Babylonian garment. And he said, I've got to have this. I've got to get this. And he took it. But the problem with what Achan took was God said, don't touch it, don't take it, because it's going to destroy you. And because of that, it cost Achan not only his life, but it cost him his whole family's life as well. Do you know what discontentment will do to your home? It'll ruin your home. Discontentment, when you open the door to envy, when you open the door to covetousness, when you open the door to greed, when you open the door to want, you're going to find out it'll destroy your home. Because your home and the people in your home need more than money and things. What they need is you. You. Sometimes we get to looking around and we get to thinking, man, if I could just be here or there, if I could just have this or that, boy, would I be happy. If I could just win the lottery. If I could just scratch off a ticket. And it said a million dollars. Do you realize there's people that have won the lottery. And it was the worst thing that ever happened in their life. That's right. It cost them everything. They lost all their friends, their family. It ended up in the poor house. It cost them their health. But somehow or another we think that's the answer to our problems. And I won 20 bucks. On a scratch off ticket. And it only cost me $50 to win. Well I wish you would do the math a little bit. They don't put them tickets out there for winners. They put them tickets out more for losers. They make money off the losers. Not the winners. Man one time he had a farm. It was a beautiful farm. Acres of farm. Orchards on that farm. Gardens on that farm. Streams on that farm. A wonderful farm. But he got to reading about diamonds. He got reading about diamonds and how wealthy he would be if he had a diamond mine. So he got to thinking, man, I want to get me a diamond mine. So he sold his farm and he went out across the world looking for a diamond mine. He searched the world over. Went all over the world. And then finally ended up poor, broken, and committed suicide. Meanwhile, the man that bought his farm one day was out and he was giving his camel a drink in the stream. He noticed something sparkling down in that stream and he picked it out 
and a rainbow hued from that when the sunlight hit it. It was a diamond. And they found out that that farm had a magnificent mine of diamonds all through it. Acres and acres and acres of diamonds. If that man would have kept that farm, he would have had all the diamonds. But he didn't realize they weren't there because he couldn't see it. Can I say this to you? You're richer than what you think. You're richer than what you know. The problem is you just can't see it. Your eyes have not been open to it. Life is a whole lot simpler when you plow around the stump than plowing over the stump. Let me give you some more advice. Letting the bull out of the barn is a whole lot easier than putting them back in. Have you ever been in contact with a bull? Yeah. If you've ever been in contact with a bull, we yeah, have Brother Roger knows all about the bull. We had a bull loose one time in Clearville. Out so in it. Passing out tracks. And man, I'm going to tell you, we were watching our backs. We knew that bull was loose. Well, I'll tell you something, when the bull gets out, it's a whole lot easier to let him out than it is to put him back in. So the best thing to do is to keep the bull in. Right? Does that make sense? Can I tell you, don't let the bull out because once the bull's out, it's a whole lot harder to put the bull back in. I want you to know there are a lot of people that are letting the bull out. You ought to learn to keep the bull in. Well, preacher, how do I learn to keep the bull in? By keeping this thing right here shut. Amen. You open your mouth and you let the bull out. <laughs> Don't let the bull out keep the bull in. I'm saying there's a lot of people that are talking, 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 talking when they ought to be keeping their mouth shut because every time they open their mouth, they insert their foot. Amen. Don't let the bull out. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 3, listen to what the Bible says. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips. Open that old barn door. Open up that gate wide. He that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Too many people are following Oscar Meyer's philosophy. Baloney. We got baloney on television. We got baloney in the news. We got baloney on the internet. We have baloney, baloney, baloney everywhere. Oh, preacher, they give me a variety of different baloney. They slice it. And I get on the internet and they grind it. And then I go someplace else and they chop it. I don't care if they slice it, they grind it, or they chop it. It's still baloney in the end. Amen. They can present it, and they can twist it, and they can turn it, and they can spin it all sorts of directions. But it's still baloney. And I'll tell you this, we ought to watch what's coming out of our mouth. There are some folks that call themselves Christians and some of the garbage, some of the foul language that's coming out of their mouth, they ought to be ashamed of themselves. Shame on you. You call yourself a child of God and you've got profanity coming out of your mouth. Shame on you. Preacher, oh, preacher, don't shame me. I'll tell you who ought to shame you. It ought to be the Holy Spirit of God. If you're a child of God and you've got the Holy Spirit of God in you and it's not shaming you, you better get somebody to check you out. Amen. And it ought to be the great physician, Jesus. A coachman one time was talking to another man. He said, those horses know when I cuss at them. And that man says, yeah, and so does God. God hears. God knows. And dirty mouths need a good cleaning. They do. My mama used to do some cleaning on my mouth. If my mouth said something it wasn't supposed to, there was a cleaning that took place. What kind of detergent do you recommend, preacher? <laughs> It don't matter whether it's bar soap or liquid soap or dish soap. They all work. Brother, dirty mouths need to be cleaned out. 
And some of our dirty mouths we need to tell God we need them cleaned out. Garbage is coming out of our mouth and there's garbage that's coming out because we allowed the garbage to get in there. And when the garbage gets in there, that's what the garbage is going to come back out. Don't have a gutter mouth. Don't, don't, don't have a sewer mouth. Don't have a profane mouth. Brother, I'll tell you, it's not halitosis the problem we have of breath stinking. It's not breath stinking that coming out of your mouth that stinks. It's the words that you've got coming out of your mouth that stinks. Because profanity comes from a profane heart. When you open up your mouth, you show everybody your mind and you show everybody your heart. You better be careful of what you're saying. Bible says, He that hath a froward heart findeth no good. Findeth no good. And a lot of talking leads to an awful lot of explaining. There shouldn't be swearing coming out of our mouth. There ought to be gossiping that's coming out of our mouth. There, there ought to be dirty, not be dirty talk that's coming out of our mouth. The Bible talks about a man by the name of Lot. Remember Lot in the Bible? Now, Lord, the Bible says he was a righteous man, but he lived among unrighteous people. Do you feel like a lot today? I mean, you're righteous and you're doing right, but boy, you've got a lot of wicked people around you. Lot, the Bible said he was vexed. That word vexed means he was troubled. Vexed, the Bible says, with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Does filthy conversation vex you? Does filthy conversation trouble you? It ought to, as a child of God. It ought to bother you. Reminds me of the little boy that sold a man to lawnmower. Man got that lawnmower back and he tried to pull that string, you know, to get that mower going. He wouldn't fire. And he pulled that string to get it going, it wouldn't fire. And he pulled that string to get it going, it wouldn't fire. He went back to that boy and he said, you sold this mower to me, it doesn't even work. He said, I pulled the string and pulled the string and pulled the string, it wouldn't fire. He said, mister, that's because you got to cuss at it. He said, cuss at it? He said, I'm a Christian. He said, I've been saved for so long and I quit cussing a long time ago. He said, it's been so long time ago, I think I've forgotten. That boy says, you keep pulling on that string, it'll come back to you. Can I tell you, you keep a pulling on that string, you'll find that it'll come back to you. Oh, you better be careful of that mouth. Hey. Letting the bull out of the barn is easier than trying to get him back in. Dirty talk comes from a dirty heart. Profane talk comes from a profane heart. Perverted talk comes from a perverted heart. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. For the Father up above, He's looking down in love. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. You better be careful. Oh, is this advice too heavy for you this morning? Preacher, I don't know about this old farmer's advice. It's awful hard. Yeah, it is hard to keep our mouth shut sometimes. And sometimes you're going to have to bite your lip. Sometimes you want to give people a piece of your mind. Don't do it. You ain't got much left, do you? Don't do it. Let me give you some more farmer's advice. Keep your fences horse high. Keep your fences pig tight. And keep your fences bull strong. Keep your fences horse high. Keep them pig tight. And keep them bull strong. In other words, what you need to do is make sure that you have some boundaries around you. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, 28, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. If you don't have some boundaries in your life, the horses will run loose. If you don't have some fences put up in your life, the pigs will get out. If you don't have some fences in your life, you're going to find out that the bull will run rampant. You need to make sure that you have your fences horse high, 
pig tight and bull strong. Have some fences put up in your life, some boundaries put up in your life so that you don't step over on that other side and find yourself in a mess. You got a dog? There are some people that have doggy fences. It is a line that is in the ground, and when that dog gets too close to that fence, it'll shock him. And he won't go any further. And it'll keep him in those boundaries. You know what I think God needs to do to some of us? Have a little doggy fence for us. And every time we get too close to that, shocks us. Keeps us in where we need to be. Because our problem is we like to ride the boundaries too much. We like to get as close as we can. Preacher, I've got a question about something. Should I do it or shouldn't I? Well, when in doubt, don't. The Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is of sin. A barbed wire fence. A barbed wire fence will not only keep them in, it'll keep them away. Have you ever gotten into a barbed wire fence? Yeah, a barbed wire fence will, will keep you back from that barbed wire fence. All you got to do is get snagged one time. Have you ever snagged your britches on the barbed wire fence? It leaves a mark, doesn't it? Uh, how'd that happen where it's frayed there, barbed wire? God needs to put some fences up in our life, and that's why God gives us the Word of God. And that's why many of times God says, I don't want you to do this because I want to put up some fence in your life. God... God ought to rule in our life and he ought to guide our life. In Isaiah 58 verse 11, the Bible says, The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Do you know what God needs to do? God says, I want to make your life like a garden. Do you know, many a times, if you want to keep the critters out of the garden, do you know what you need? A fence. You want to keep the deer from getting in, the groundhogs from getting in, you know what you need? A fence. Why? To protect the garden. God wants to protect you. God wants to make you like a well-watered garden and protect you. The presence of God can make all the difference in the world. Native Americans... The Indians have a unique practice. They train their young braves. By the age of 13, they have their child trained in hunting, scouting, and fishing. There's one final test that they'll do. They'll take them out in the woods in the middle of the night, and they'll blindfold them. And then in the middle of the night, they'll take that blindfold off and leave him all alone. And that boy, as he's out there in the woods, will hear noises. And he'll think, oh, what is that out there? A wild animal that's going to pounce on me. What is that noise? I don't know what it is. And he'd be scared to death. But as soon as the morning would break and the daylight would start, he would see the figure of a man that was standing there not too far from him. And that man that's standing there not too far from him is his father. And his father is armed with a bow and with an arrow. And the whole night while that boy is out there in the woods scared to death, Scared and spooked and startled at every sound. That father is right there all that time watching over him. Can I tell you, in the world we're living in, it can be, be pretty spooky. Pretty scary. But your heavenly father is watching. Do you know why God tells you what he has told you in the Bible? Because he wants you to keep your fences horse high. Pig tight and bull strong. Let me give you some more old farmer's advice. I'm saying they're not as dumb as you think they are. They get more brains than you give them credit for. Next, feed the pigs, but don't crawl in their pen. Feed the pigs, but don't crawl in their pen. In other words, evangelize and reach the lost, but don't dive into what the lost are diving into. Bible says in Matthew 7 verse 6 give not that which is holy unto the dogs neither cast ye your pearls before the swine 
lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Do you realize that the world does not value the things of God? It should not surprise you that they think you're crazy for being here on a Sunday morning. For coming through the rain and coming to church. For putting a tithe in the offering plate. They think you're nuts, you're crazy, you're insane. There's probably some people in our church that think that's crazy, nuts, and insane too. Putting a tithe in the offering plate. Well, I preach, I don't do that. Well, you ought to do that. It shouldn't surprise you that the world looks at you as a little odd. Because we're living in a sinful world. They don't value the things of God. They don't value old-fashioned holiness. They don't value genuine Christianity. God many of times told Israel, the heathen that are around you, don't get yourself mingled in with them. Because when you get yourself mingled in with them, you'll start acting like them. Do you know why you feed the pigs, but don't get into the pig pen with the pigs? Well, maybe nobody here has ever had pigs. But you can't take the pig out of a pig. No matter how hard you try. And if you get into the pig pen with the pigs, you'll find out you'll start smelling like a pig. And you'll start acting like a pig. God said to Israel, don't walk after the manner of the other nations which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhor them. But I have said unto you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which hath separated you from other people. Now I'll talk to people here this morning, they'll say, I'm not going to play with bees because I might get stung. I'm not going to play with a snake because I might get bit. We had some men here, oh you should have been here on Wednesday, was it Wednesday? Sunday night. Sunday night. You know what, you know what you miss when you're not here on Sunday night? I ain't going to tell you. But we had a snake here on Sunday night, didn't we? Oh, now we'll wake up. As soon as I say snake, it, did, it wasn't in the sanctuary, friend, okay? Don't get that excited. It was out in the parking lot. But they took care of him. No more snake. Snake is dead. <laughs> Amen. Yes. No more snake. They didn't play with the snake. They took care of the snake. Because if you play with a snake, you'll get bit. Right. You play with a bee, you'll get stung. Because that's their nature. Remember the prodigal son? The prodigal son lost all of his money. And then a buddy of his in a foreign country. The Bible says a citizen of that country pointed him to the pig pen. I want you to go. You can go feed the hogs. Do you know who pointed him to the pig pen? Somebody from this old world. Somebody that is a citizen of this world. Pointed him to the pig pen. Do you know why God doesn't give you everything you want? Because if you give a pig and a boy everything they want, you got a good pig and you got a bad boy. You won't get everything you want, but you'll get what you need. And here the prodigal son is in the pig pen. And finally the Bible said he came to himself. And when he came to himself, he got out of the pig pen. And my friend, there might be some folks here this morning that just need to get out of the pig pen. You're going to the hogs. That's why you're so dirty. You're going to the hogs. That's why in your vocabulary you got oink. You're going to the hogs. That's why you got a curl in your tail and you got mud all over you. Because you're going to the hogs. You know what you need to do? You need to do the same thing the prodigal son did. What did the prodigal son do? He went home to father. You need to go back home. 
You want to be that little pig that goes wee, wee, wee all the way home. <laughs> Feed the pigs, but don't climb into their pen. Let me give you some more old farmer's advice. When the tractor gets stuck, stop digging. Yeah, when that tractor gets stuck, stop digging. All you're going to do is get buried deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And there are Christians this morning that are spinning their wheels and spinning their wheels and spinning their wheels. Why don't you get yourself a wench line? Why don't you get yourself a tow? Why don't you get yourself a pull so you can get out of the hole that you have spun so deep? You see, when your tractor gets stuck, stop digging. Do you remember Paul in the Bible? Paul, he's torturing and throwing Christians into jail, killing them. And he's on his way to Damascus. Remember that story? And as he's on his way to Damascus and he's on his way there, God knocks him down and blinds him. And he hears a voice from heaven and he says, Who art thou? He said, I'm Jesus. Whom thou persecutest? He said, it is hard for me to kick against the pricks. Paul was laying down on the ground. He can't get any lower. Paul, when you're in a hole, stop digging. Remember Jonah? Jonah in the Bible. Jonah ended up in a hole. In the belly of a whale. Jonah... When your tractor gets stuck, stop spinning wheels. Stop digging. And what did Jonah do? Jonah put himself together, a little altar, and he went to prayer. And he sought the Lord. And the Lord caused that well to spit Jonah out on dry land. I'm saying when your tractor gets stuck, it's a good time to stop digging. Because God can pick you up. God can pull you out. And God can place you on the rock. Listen to what the psalmist says. I waited patiently on the Lord and he inclined unto me. And heard my cry. And brought me up also out of this horrible pit. Out of the miry clay. And set my feet upon a rock. And established all my goings. God is able to give you the pull you need. God is able to supply the toe that you need. God is able to supply the winch line that you need. We ought to pray. Stop doing it in our own power and get a hold of God's power. It's not 911 that we need. It's God that we need. It's a woman one time, she was in a textile mill. And in this textile mill, there was a sign that said, When your thread becomes tangled, call the foreman. Well, she was new to the job. And the thread got tangled and she tried to fix it. But the problem just got worse. So finally she called the foreman. And she said to the foreman, I did the best I could. He said, no, you didn't. The best you could do was to call me. The best we can do is to make a call to our Heavenly Father. Amen. We need to push. P-U-S-H. As an acronym. Pray until something happens. Pray. Amen. God's advice is good advice. God's advice might be old. But it's still good. Amen. Do you know what I see a lot of people lacking today? We have such technology. And since we have all sorts of technology, we think that people are so much smarter. We've got so much technology today, people can't even read. They don't even have to spell because they've got spell check on their, their phone. They don't have to write or type because they can just speak it and it comes across there. I don't think we're getting smarter. Technology might be moving along, but we're not certainly not smarter. And we're certainly not wiser. 
If we want to have wisdom, we need to make sure that we get into the book of wisdom because the Bible said the Lord giveth wisdom. Not your college course giveth wisdom. Not your high school diploma giveth wisdom. It said God giveth wisdom. And I'm not against education, but I would much rather have some Bible without education. And so God's advice is old, but it certainly is not outdated. And you know what the children are going to sing this week at Bible school? The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Let me ask you this question. Where are you standing? When you get to the point that you know it all, boy, you're in a sad, sad shape. Because everyone here already knows you don't know it all. Because everybody here knows they don't know it all. And I don't know it all. But I know who does. God does. Amen. And God has given us what he wants us to know in this book right here. The Bible. The book of wisdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Lord, we're thankful, God, for the wisdom that you give. And Lord, as we think about Bible school, Lord, as we think about this time we'll be gathering these children together, we're going to point them to that book of wisdom, the Bible, the Word of God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you, Christian, this morning, do you have the wisdom you need? Can I tell you, God's got the wisdom you need, and God can give it to you. I wonder how many Christians here this morning say, Preacher, I'd like some more wisdom from God. Here's my hand. I'd like some more wisdom from God. I want to make right decisions. I want to do what God wants me to do. I'm willing to do that. You can put your hands back down. I wonder if there's anybody here this morning say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved, that I'm a child of God, but I need to be saved. I need the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you slip your hand up if that's you? You need Jesus. You need to be born again. You need to be a child of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray, I pray, dear God, that you would be with these folks that slip their hand up. Lord, give them the wisdom they need. Lord, we're making decisions every day. We need to make those decisions in wisdom. Lord, help us at this Bible school to pass on God's wisdom, God's truth from his word to these children. Help us to do our part. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, if you'll take your hymn book and turn to 441, we'll stand and sing. Maybe this morning you need to come and pray for yourself or for someone else. Maybe this morning you want to come and pray for Bible school starting this